I've lived here on the Washtenaw River and near it for the last 55 or 60 years. I've grown up, I've seen the changes that, that's occurred here over the years. And uh, <clears throat> when I was a kid, the, the area across the river on the east side of the river, which is now Mollisey Farms, was a, a state game management area. <clears throat> and it uh, produced an abundance of deer, turkey, squirrel, all the local wildlife. And uh, it was well preserved by the state until uh, it was sold for a farming endeavor in, uh, in the 60s and it was cleared. Approximately 17,000 acres were cleared and a levee erected around it. I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see the levee uh, going to open up where the, the area can flood again as it did prior to the levee. I'd like to see <clears throat> I'd like for my descendants to see the uh, see it reforested and revegetated and produce wildlife as it did when I was a, a young person. This is Upper Washita National Wildlife Refuge, and we're standing on a 17 mile levee built back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, the plans are to breach this levee in five spots to reintroduce the Washita River to the floodplain, the 16,000 acre floodplain. What you're looking at, that's the 16,000 acres that we hope to restore the Washita River floodplain to. What it's doing now, you can see there's water in here now and all the water's coming through a eight foot pipe. So what it does when the river gets up, you've got water pushing through here at a slower rate. And when the river falls out, you've got all this water. And now it's all got to go back out through that eight, eight foot pipe. And it just, it holds the water in here longer than what it should. Um, it's never, it can never catch up with the river really. Historically, uh, every late winter, early spring, as the snows and winter rains began to hit up above us, the river would flood and over flood its banks, and it would gradually seep through the forest that were once behind us here in this large 25 square mile cleared area, and it would just be a mecca for all types of waterfowl, and uh, the fisheries would come out into the floodplain into spawn in the spring, but they've been cut off from that opportunity now. Well, what you're seeing behind you is, is one of the largest single uh, floodplain reforestation projects in the entire lower Mississippi Valley. Just over 10,000 acres of trees have been planted in here, and they are adapted to a natural flooding regime. But with these levees here, we get rainwater trapped inside the levees, and the water stands on the trees too long. So it can actually cause mortality to the trees that have been replanted out here on this floodplain. And we hope that this serves as a demonstration project that we can use at other sites up and down the river. And we hope to prove here that the, the values of reconnecting the river to its floodplain are many, not just biologic, but also the water quality and the sediments and the nutrients. We hope to demonstrate that here at Mollisey Farms. Another one of the benefits of floodplain restoration is using the full capacity of the floodplain to store waters to mitigate for floods. And where we're standing at right here today was a site in 1991 where this levee with it's about 25 or 30 feet uh, tall actually broke because of the floodwaters. The Washita River behind us had rose to almost record levels and it was almost 30 feet higher than you see it today and it was lapping at the top of this levee. The other side of the levee there was barely any water out there so as the waters of the river began to eat away at the levee, the levee collapsed right here and fell in a, in a catastrophic single event. And this floodplain behind us, 25 square miles of floodplain, filled up with water between 25 and 30 feet deep almost instantaneously. And what that did, you can actually look at the records, the river stage records on the Washita River, which is about, uh, at Monroe, which is about 35 miles south of us, and you can see within a few hours of the time that levee collapsed and this floodplain filled up to almost 25 or 30 feet deep, 
the river gauge, the stages at Monroe dropped six inches almost instantaneously a few hours after this floodplain filled up with water. So the storage potential of floodplains like this is tremendous for people living downstream. Now, you know, six inches might not sound like a lot to, to many of us, but if you're, if you're piling sandbags up to protect your house, it can be extremely critical, and that's why. Uh, yeah, that's the levee there. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty tall. Uh, and it's grown up, so it's in very bad shape. And if we keep getting these events, these flood events year after year without any work on it, it's gonna uh, break on its own, but we don't want a catastrophic break. We would like a uh, uh, break it where we would we want it to be broke to cause less damage, of, you know, to the habitat. This refuge is used throughout the waterfowl season by uh, duck hunters, and so. Each day there are numerous people that will be using the area and by removing the levee and allowing the river to move back into these former agricultural lands, uh, we will make these lands more accessible uh, to the users of the refuge from the river. Actually this project is, is an outstanding example of partnerships between the government and NGOs and the private sector and the universities because uh, it's just amazing how people have come together on this. The original partners were the service and the Nature Conservancy and the, uh, and the EPA and the, and the State Department of Environmental Quality. But uh, since we have developed the project, uh, we're now going to have a, a monitoring program that takes place for several years after the breaches and there are several universities as well as the USGS that will be involved in monitoring the changes that take place. Part of my heritage, and I I love it. <laughs>